All right, thank you. Welcome, everyone, to our session two uh, of our webinar on the emerging induced very potent stem cell applications in drug discovery. This webinar is done in a collaboration between Molecular Devices and Griner Bio One. My name is Kasia Pasta, and I will be your host today. I'd like to introduce to you our speakers for today. Reiner Heller with Reiner Bio One. He is a product manager and has been with the, with Reiner for over 12 years now. Uh, your second presenter will be Kathleen Salano, and she is an application scientist in Europe with Molecular Devices. She has joined uh, Molecular Devices in um, 2011. And then uh, our final presenter will be Christian Holt. And he has been, uh, he's also our European application scientist for the imaging product lines, and he has been with the company for over five and a half years. So welcome to our presenters, and with that, I will hand it off to Reiner. Okay, thanks, Kesa, for the kind introduction, and hello, everybody, and welcome to our today's webinar. As introduction, we thought to start with honoring the Nobel Prize winners in medicine or physiology of this year. This Nobel Prize was given to John Gerber and Shinya Yamanaka for their discovery that major cells can be reprogrammed to become pluripotent. The special and fascinating about this finding is that now pluripotent stem cells, so-called induced pluripotent stem cells, can be generated from human somatic cells, including disease-derived cells. And major cells, including nerve, heart, and liver cells can be derived from induced pluripotent stem cells, allowing scientists today now to study disease mechanisms in really new, new ways. As the use of human-derived embryonic stem cells in research is quite restricted, induced pluripotent stem cells do offer an idle alternative, especially for drug discovery research. Human-induced pluripotent stem cells are meanwhile commercially available, and our attempt was to test such cell lines in practical approaches. And today, we would like to show you our experience and results in this webinar. So this agenda gives an overview about the different sections of the webinar. We will start with a very short technical summary about the scientific basics of induced pluripotent stem cells and an explanation why we selected neural cells as models. Then we will describe our experimental approaches where our experience in maintaining, growing, and differentiation of two human IPS cells is summarized. In the next section, the use materials with a focus on devices and microplates are described. The obtained results will be discussed by first describing each experimental approach followed by the data analysis, which was done either in a high throughput manner, a high content screening manner, or both. And with a short summary and outlook, the webinar will end. Induced pluripotent stem cells were produced first in 2006 from mice and in 2007 from human cells by the team of Shinya Yamanaka. Somatic cells, for example fibroblasts, were forced to express the embryogenic relevant genes of 3-4, SOX2, KLF4, and SILMIC by viral infection. These reprogramming genes, which are considered as oncogenes, lead to the differentiation of somatic cells into embryonic light cells. So IPS cells are believed to be similar to natural pluripotent stem cells, such as embryonic stem cells. But the full extent of their relation to natural pluripotent stem cells is still under investigation. Where its progress has been made in the last years and nowadays, nevertheless, it must be said that the therapeutic use of induced pluripotent stem cells is really still far off. However, in drug discovery, induced pluripotent stem cells have a great opportunity as they can be human and not only animal derived. derived. And due to their great specificity, they can be differentiated in virtually all cell types of an organism, and there are no ethical or legal restrictions, unlike the original human embryonic stem cells. Furthermore, an almost, almost unlimited pool of source cells for various specific human IPS, including disease specific IPS for new experimental approaches, is available. And last but not least, 
produce human embryonic stem cells are relatively easy to maintain, handle, and propagate. Why did we now select more cells, or better to say, human IPS differentiated into neurons as a model? The main reason was the interest of many, many scientists in this kind of research, which is used to study neuron degenerative diseases. In an aging society, such diseases like Alzheimer, dementia, or Parkinson do really play an increasing importance and an efficient treatment of these diseases would be doubtless a major progress in medicine. These two pictures on this slide show an example of a neuron outward assay, which is a typical test used to screen compound mediating activation of microglial cells. The images were kindly provided by the Max Planck Institute for Molecular Biomedicine in Münster. The used disease model is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS. In ALS, the aberrant activation of microglial cells plays an integral role in the chronic phase. Therefore, agents mediating toxicity of microglial cells may delay disease progression. The left image shows neurons growing on non-inhibited microglial cells, and the suppressed development of the neural cells is clearly demonstrated. The right image shows neural cells growing on microglial cells with suppressed activation. The neurons form dendrites and will show a higher vitality. And as a disease model, mouse embryonic stem cells are grown on plant microglial creative oral microclade. And the analysis in this essay can be done or was done, including the detection of branch points, the length of axons, and the survival of the cells of the neuron. Now a short overview about our, exper our experimental approach. The first experimental approach was the use of a human fortune derived IPS cell line which we purchased from system biosciences. We tried to differentiate this IPS cell line into neurons for further testing. The second experimental approach was the use of a pre differentiated cell line from cellular dynamics. These so called I cell neurons are a mixture of post mitotic neural subtypes compromised primarily of beta ergic and glutamata ergic neurons with typical physiological characteristics and responses. In parallel, as a control, the live laser a better maximized with protein assay from in vitro gen was conducted. And the idea on this assay, uh, the simulation of a G protein coupled receptor is detected. So it's a classic high throughput screening assay, GPCR based assay. And the test is based on PHO K1 cells expressing the human acetylcholine uh, muscarinic subtype 1 receptor, the M1 receptor. So, this slide here shows the workflow for generating neurons from a human IPS cell line, which was obtained from, or which we get, we got from system biosciences. And I do not want to go into details about the different workflow steps, as it would take much too long, but I would like to name some of the obstacles we faced. First of all, the whole process was extremely time consuming. It took us nearly two months until we received the first differentiated cells and results. And furthermore, the generation of neurons from scratch was very, very labor-intensive and expensive due to the need for daily time-consuming media exchange over more than two months. After our experience, we placed the first IPS approach as not idle or non-idle for a routine drug discovery test. In contrast, the ICELs or the use of ICELs, the pre-differentiated neurons from cellular dynamics was but the use was really quite convenient, and the results were obtained after 10 days as no pre is required. Also, there is no need for an expensive special media such as the messenger or something else. The tests are just seeded directly on PNO laminin coated microplane. The media change is only necessary every third to fourth day, and therefore the ICELs are our preferred model for the subsequent testing. So let's move to the section about with microplates and substrate. For all tests, microclear or for all tests, select near bottom microplates are used. And the neurons require polyomitin coating with a subsequent laminin coating. 
We tested also third party tools or quality like encoded microplanes, but found the best performance with originally we commanded polling on it with lemon encoding. In this slide here gives an overview about the different available surfaces to make microplanes for the coating and for the code of the cells. First of all, there are sensor plates and sensor plates plus. These are flat bottom microplates. These flat bottom microplates consist out of a polystyrene frame with a glued 175 micrometer thick glass bottom. Glass is an amorphous non crystalline solid material. It is brittle and optically highly transparent. The refractive index of a standard polymer silicon glass is typically 1.522. Glass is the gold standard in high resolution microscopy. However, coating of glass is, to our experience, to our knowledge, is very, very difficult, and we do not recommend glass bottom microplates for such very sensitive cell lines, like the E5PS. The second, there is the large range of microclear polystyrene microplates. Microclear is our spider brand name for black or white clear bottom microplates, manufactured completely out of polystyrene. Polystyrene is a semi crystalline or amorphous material. It is highly transparent with limited flexibility and a refractive index of 1.51. The microclear microplates are typically a film bottom, 190 micrometer film bottom, and they are with different cell culture treatments available. Cell culture treated microplates will be or are also our recommendation for the polyomicin laminin coating, which is required for the code of, of the IPS device year one. Finally, there is a new product line which we call the Green Star. The Green Star microplates are manufactured out of cyclolysine with a 190 micrometer cyclolysine film bottom. These cyclolysine cyclolysines are amorphous polymers with glass-like characteristics. Cyclolysines do have great, excellent optical properties with low light absorbance rates and low photofluorescence, especially in the UV. Their refractive index with 1.533 is very close to the refractive index to class of class. And the plates are also cell culture treated available for the best performance in, a, in the required polyomicin laminin coating process. Our focus was in general on the 1536 cyclolysine microplates in our assays in order to demonstrate the performance of this new microplate surface in a high throughput screening approach with a very sensitive cell culture system. However, all tests we have done in parallel in classic polystyrene clear film bottom plate, which you will see also in the results. So the next slide is uh, explained by Christian, and I will continue afterwards. Christian, please help me. So I need Christian. Ah, here Hello? Goes. Yeah, I so Yes, so in this slide we want to show the superior optical properties of the uh, screen star plates, so the uh, cyclohelicine plate in comparison to normal uh, microclear cholesterol plates. So in these images here uh, on the left, um, you have a really low order fluorescence in comparison to the uh, cholesterol uh, microclear plates in the middle. So what we did here, we used uh, uh, our um, automated microscope and just focus uh, not on style, just just in the middle of the plate, in the middle of the plastic, uh, to get the autofluorescence. And we also compare that to a competitor plate, which uh, is a little bit thicker, but here you can clearly see, like, you know, we have about uh, twice the average intensity, so quite high autofluorescence. So this really speaks for the uh, image quality and optical properties of these plates. Okay, thanks Christian for your help and for the explanation. And so because of the excellent performance of these cyclonicine in microscopic applications, we thought about or we decided to enlarge the product range by the Screen Star brand, which includes microplates in 96 well, 384 well, and 1536 well, format. The 1536 well, Screen Star microplate is available, so can be um, ordered directly. The 96 star plate will launch at the SLAS beginning of next year, and the 384 star screen star microplates are in the beta test. So if you like to receive some samples, let us know. Common for all screen star microplates is their recessed film bottom. Due to the small gap between the plate bottom and the microplate rim, very low working distances in microscopy are possible. Therefore, high magnification objectives 
as well as oil or water immersion objectives do not need to be moved in the set axis over large distances. In the last slide, I would like to come to the end of the microblade section with the slide here showing the excellent, excellent performance of, of the Streamstar 96 type blade in a non confocal standard microscopic application. For the test, we stayed cell going on a cell cut treated 96 cell three star plate surface with shapey, dubbing, and phalloidine, a very simple staining. And then the imaging was done with oil immersion and 63 fold magnification using a standard Leica fluorescent microscope. I, I think it's really obvious that the pictures we made with the Stream Star microblade to show much higher resolution compared to pictures made with static polystyrene zone bottom blades. And now it's Kathleen's turn and Christian's turn for Kathleen, so she will tell more about instruments and the results. Um, either with the paradigm or with the uh, high content imaging system from molecular devices. So, Kathleen, please go ahead with the presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction, Rainer. So, uh, Christian and I will now be presenting the instruments that were used in the following test. So, Christian will later present the Image Express Micro XL, which is an automated microscope used for high content screening, and I will now present you the spectrum of the paradigm, which is an upgradable placing platform. So what are the highlights of the instrument? The spectrum of the paradigm is unique as a design allows it to be upgradable. So if you want to add any new applications to the reader in the future, you can easily change the system or the configuration without actually buying a new system. And with this integrated uh, photo multipliers, we actually have two of them. You can easily perform dual wavelength experiments in a very fast uh, manner and also increasing your data quality at the same time. It allows you to do top and bottom reading, and with the opting or with the option to do a signal satellite optimization, you can actually focus the signal into the right uh, layer to get the best uh, sensitivity with your assay. And you can use six layer plates up to 15, 36 layer plates in high throughput settings. And on top, we do offer a fast read mode, which is called on the fly, to even read your uh, plates faster than you can do with a standard reading mode, especially for high throughput design. And on top, it's very integration friendly, so it's ready to go for automation uh, solutions, and you can easily integrate a plate stacker like the stack map from molecular devices or integrated in any other liquid handling system that might that you might already have. So why is the system so flexible? So you have a base unit on one side which you will buy, but on the other side um, you will have optical cartridges which are um, which do have a light source inside, monochromators and filters, and they are actually um, set for the essay and for your needs uh, that you will require to run your experiment. Inside the base unit, you will only have, uh, or you will have the plate handler, the environmental control, as well as the detection system. And the optical cartridges that we are provide um, can be optimized uh, to your essay needs, so dedicated cartridges for one essay, but we also do offer multi-functional cartridges which can go with multiple essays that you might run in your lab. So those cartridges can be added into the system, so we do have six uh, positions in the top and the bottom, and you can easily change these cartridges with two minutes manual interventions. You can do that. You can configure your instrument, but you can also replace uh, new cartridges in the system. We can add any new cartridges that we develop, and you can add uh, them to the system. So the base unit itself does not require any change. You can simply add the cartridge to your existing unit. So if we now take a closer look at the cartridge, and I show a dual wavelength cartridge in this example, 
And he had used the gene plaser cartridge in our experiment, which is, a, as I said, a dual wavelength, um, a dual wavelength cartridge. So if we slice uh, through the cartridge, what you will see is actually um, the interior that I show in this cartoon. And you do have a light source in there, which is a high power LED. And this high power LED can easily be triggered to the intensity needed uh, for your sample. So you can have a lower power or higher power, and then the LED is adjusted in its intensity. So the excited light from the LED goes onto a beam splitter. Part of the light is then reflected onto a photodiode, which is used for signal optimal uh, normalization. And then it goes onto a dichroic mirror, which reflects the light into your well. And then your sample gets excited. The light gets um, emitted from your sample and then goes back into the cartridge, and you can then uh, detect uh, two wavelengths with one wavelength going onto the first PMT and the second wavelength going onto the second PMT. And with this design, you can easily read FRED experiments, low sense polarization, or other dual emission assays which do require a fast read and reading two wavelengths at the same time. Looking into the sensitivity of the systems, I'm showing you a floor steam dilution series, which um, I had uh, recently run. And you can easily see that we can cover a range of uh, seven logs dynamic uh, concentration range, which is very good um, compared to common plate readers where you do have to adjust the photomultiplier of voltage. We, as I said, we do adjust uh, the intensity of or high power LED because it's triggered much faster than a PMT from one sensitivity level to another. Coming to the software part of the reader, we are using Softmax Pro 6, which does control the reader, and at the same time you can do a data analysis in the software. It's ready to go for DXP department, so if you develop an essay in R&D, you can then later transfer it easily to quality control. So you, you do uh, set up your measurement parameters, and then the data gets populated in the plate section. As you can see below, you see the um, you see the values in there. But at the same time, you can also look at these uh, numbers as a color gradient, or you can look at them like a 3D plot just to make it easier for you to view your data. Then the data can be exported in Excel or text format, but if you want to do a further analysis in the software, you can use the analysis part of the software. You can populate your data, which you have retrieved in the play section. You can consolidate them into the table sections by standards, um, controls that you have used, so you can divide them into different um, templates and then calculate the mean, median, and CV values. And uh, you can also do uh, other st apply other statistical formulas or queries to actually do a quality assessment of your parameters. Then the data can be further transferred into a cross section if required, and then you can actually evaluate uh, your data. You can fit your data with different uh, curve models, like the 4P, 5P, or linear fitting. And then below the graph, you will actually see statistical parameters, but also curve fitting parameters as well. Uh, you could do a parallel line analysis combined with a potency uh, analysis. And if you do require, like, a short summary report at the uh, the beginning of your experiment, what you can do is add in your SOP, your essay details, into a note section, and then also do a summary of the parameters which you have uh, populated in the standards uh, on your group sections as well in, as in the graph section, and then display your potency parameters, for example. And all these body, uh, protocol sections can be saved as a template, and you can then later reuse them for other measurements and just import new data in there. And with this, I would like to hand over to Christian. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Now, before we actually look at some of the results, I would like to give you a short introduction of the Image Express Micro, the Image Express Micro XL. So, uh, this is uh, a fully automated high content screening microscope uh, with a small footprint, so it actually fits in any lab. Um, it's uh, fully automated, as I already said. Um, it uses a high speed laser autofocus to uh, focus uh, on the plate. And you can actually use it with any kind of plate format from any kind of manufacturer. So no matter if it's like a one watt plate or a 1536 watt plate, you can actually set it up on that microscope. Now, for different kind of assays, you can actually equip it from anything from a 1x objective to 100x objective. So to acquire really um, like a, a big field of view, so I also like the 100 x objective um, looking at e stars or any kind of high resolution um, uh, images, you can uh, use like 100 x objective. Now what's new in that instrument is that we actually have equipped it with a large camera chip. So uh, you will see in a moment how that actually compares to a normal general kind of camera chip which is usually available on the market. Um, now, we also put a new LED light source in that instrument, and you'll see what kind of advantages that has. And also, we have now a new digital console drop-in in our software. Now, looking at the large camera chip, so this is an image from our common user standard uh, camera. And if you compare that now to an image from the uh, XL camera chip, you can see it's about three and a half times the area. And it's especially nice for uh, new art styles because you, with one image, cover a much, a much larger area. You're much faster in acquisition. And the risk or chance that you actually cut objects uh, in two or just have uh, less objects on the edge of the image is much reduced. So down here, you actually see like a, uh, an outline of a 384 well. And uh, in green, you see the area being covered by four x objectives. So with this magnification, you almost cover the whole area of the 384 well. Now, the LED light source has the advantage of a much longer um, uh, lifetime as a standard ceiling lamp, and also doesn't require shutters. So uh, there's no uh, moving parts in the microscope in terms of shutter anymore. Also, you have a very high uh, intensity stability and no degradation of light over time. But you still can cover the whole spectrum from the blue to the red in excitation light. What we also have is the digital console, which is an on-the-fly uh, algorithm. On the left-hand side, this image here, you see an image without digital console. On the right-hand side, with digital console. And especially here in the tubuline of that cell, you see it's much clearer and that also helps later on in image analysis. So it's a very nice problem. Now, what we also have further developed is our image analysis. So in our software, which is called MetaExpress, we have ready-made image analysis application modules. But now we also have a custom module editor with which you can actually create your own kind of image analysis modules. Now, this is a drag and drop option, and you can build a workflow of image analysis. For example, in this case here, like the detection of nuclei, and the second step then detection of these granular structures, either within the cytoplasm or the nuclear area. Now, what you do see is always your workflow, like in which step you are. Now, this can be made into an application module and then run over the platform, over all your images within a while or your whole screen. Now, the Image Express Micro can be equipped with different kind of hardware options. So on the left-hand side here, you see environmental control. The whole upper light part of that instrument is environmental controllable. So not only temperature, but also CO2 and humidity control. So you can keep your cells uh, alive, like in an incubator for several days. Where is that transmitted light? This is particularly nice for um, for... Uh, images where you don't uh, stain your sample. So we have a real condenser here. You can color your light, and you can also use transmitted light. And here on the right-hand side, you see our options for fluidics. So this is an online pipette where you can pipette any kind of compounds 
uh, to your site uh, online. This is particularly nice for uh, things like uh, custom fluid uh, custom um, influx. Now, the Image Express Micro is part of a, a complete imaging solution. So here you acquire your images. Uh, they're going to be stored in the database from which they're going to be retrieved from our image analysis software, and the analysis results go back into the database. From here, the analysis results can be retrieved by our Acuity Express software, which is a stellar informatics software. And here you can do your normalizations and create your graphs and do your statistics. Now, this was used for the light laser assay. And Rhino will tell us a little bit more about the life, uh, about the micro ID uh, assay. Okay, thank you, Christian. Um, we have a first assay we tried with the um, induced, differentiated induced fluid potential sensors, so the new ones. Um, what the MITO ID is. The MITO ID is a membrane potential cytotoxicity chip me which measures fluctuation in the control membrane potential, utilizing a cationic dual emission dye that exists as green fluorescent monomers in the cytosol and accumulate as orange fluorescent J aggregates in the mitochondria. Mitochondria having a low membrane potential will accumul accumulate low concentration of dye and will exhibit green fluorescence, while more highly polarized mitochondria will exhibit orange red fluorescence. Now, exhibit the shift from orange to green fluorescence as mitochondrial function becomes in increasingly compromised. The MITO ID is a lifestyle dye which is a big advantage and does not need any preliminary fixation step. So it's very fast and easy to handle and the fixation step, you will see later on, is also an advantage, this missing fixation step. And furthermore, the signal is very, very strong so that the MITO ID can be used in microscopy and as well in fluorescent readouts. We have focused in our analysis basically on the fluorescent readouts. And Jasmine will go further in the presentation and show you the rest of the results. Thank you, Helena. So on this slide, I would like to show you a data that was generated with a paradigm using the MITRE ID essay and having that uh, in a 1536 cell uh, screen star plate. I would like to highlight that this was a 15, 13, 6 uh, screen star plate, and we have not seen uh, data in such a uh, plate format with such a well density before. So in the plate layout, which you see on the upper right-hand side, we had um, piloted the star of boring concentration in a way that it was going to the higher concentrations uh, to the right. And by that, uh, the sector was decreasing, as you can see. So red is meaning you have get a high sector, and blue is um, for a low signal. And that data was then populated into a graph section, and showing uh, 4P uh, log curves. We are only viewing the data from the orange uh, signal here, from the 590 nanometer channel. And we could nicely plot um, the IC50 here, which uh, we had determined as 0, uh, 0.042 micromolar. And with this, I would like to go to the next essay. And Vina will yes. explain. Yes, this is my, again, my part. So I will take some words about the second essay we, we used for our trials for our test, which was the better like and the better like the maze essay, a live laser essay from in vitro gen. Mm. The live laser is a fresh essay based on gene plays of CHO cells containing a human acetylcholine receptor. And this CPCR is data integrated into a so called cell sensor better like the maze reported gene construct. And without CPCR activation very simple, the better like the maze remains inactive and the fluorescent substrate emits the green fluorescent signal at 520 nanometers. And if GPCR activation takes place, so, so after GPCR stimulation, the better lactamase becomes uh, activated and cleaves the fluorescent substrate in two dyes and disrupts the thread, so that exciting at 409 nanometer produces a blue fluorescent signal at 447 nanometer. And this blue signal can be readily observed 
under microscope or in a reader, a microplate reader. The image or the signal is relatively weak, so the slice tracer is a relatively yeah, weak signal assay. And we show you data, or Kathleen and Christian will show you the data with the two devices and we'll also show some comparison. Okay, so. Thank you. So I will uh, start with the data that we have generated with uh, the Paradigm, the plate reader. And we had, have used uh, multiple plate types uh, for this, which Reiner had earlier explained. And to measure the live plate, though, we have equipped um, the plate reader with a Dean Placer cartridge, a dedicated cartridge for the live laser assays with uh, the right filter set. And in the current cartoon, uh, what you are seeing is the plate layout and the pipetting pattern that we have used for this experiment. So the stimulated cells are shown in green here with increasing cutter hole concentration to the left. And to the right, we had arranged the unstimulated cells as well as the background cells. And the obtained data was then populated in the data section in the software. And what you see here are the two wavelengths which were measured. So wavelength one with an emission filter at 465, and the second uh, wavelength with an emission filter at 535. And then the data was uh, transformed into a ratio as described in literature. Going to the next uh, slide, where we do see the plotted data of uh, the plates that we have read with a live placer in the paradigm. And the aim and the goal of this experiment was to compare different plate types and to see whether we do see any effect uh, from the material or the well size itself on the EZ50s. So the EZ50s for all the plates, or so for the five plates that we have measured, for the screen star, for the PS micro uh, PR plate and the competition was not significantly different, which we had expected since the material does not have such an effect on the plate reader um, reading. So with this, I would like to go to the next experiment that we had um, done. And this was now um, going, or we went to do a further test um, using different measurement settings of the Spectromax uh, paradigm. So for this test, we had decided uh, to choose the 1536 uh, PS micro uh, clear plate. And we did vary the read modes from stack read to on the fly, which I had earlier mentioned. And as I, as I already mentioned, the on the fly read mode uh, is a faster read mode than just simply doing a stop read mode. So with a stop read, you would um, need six minutes to read a full 1536 file plate. And when you switch to the two on the fly modes that we offer with the instrumentation, you can actually achieve a decrease in the measurement time down to 1.5 or one minute per total plate. So what does it actually mean, stop read? And um, the stop read um, represents a measurement of the signal after the well sender was positioned under the read head. So the signal is detected without actually moving the plate. And the signal integration time is set by the user. And in my experiment, I had used 140 milliseconds. And for the total plate, I would then have uh, that then took, took me uh, six minutes. If we now switch to the on-the-fly mode, which is different in uh, the read mode, as we can already see it from the pattern in the cartoon I have put in here. So what actually happens is while the plate carrier is moving the plate um, under the read head, actually there is a signal detected while it's moving in the center of the well. And we do distinguish between two on the fly modes. So we have optimized for speed on one side, which is really designed to obtain the fastest possible read time. But we also have one where the read uh, or where the speed of the movement of the plate carrier is slightly reduced just to achieve uh, higher performance. And 
what the customer would actually decide for really depends on the experiment, the approach, and the speed that they actually need. And we see for the rice laser measurement that we had performed here, we could actually use the fastest on-the-fly speed mode because we, the data is very comparable, as we can see in the graph above the table, and the EC50 values are very comparable to each other. And with this, I would like to hand over to Christian to explain the results from the microscope. So we also have acquired the same kind of plate with the image express micro using a 40x objective, and we use the uh, cyberleucine plate to screen our plate. So uh, here in these two images, you see on the upper um, image, so this is in blue a montage of a certain area of that plate, so montaging images together. Um, and uh, here you see a concentr concentration gradient uh, of particle. Um, so from the left um, with a high concentration and uh, right to with the uh, low concentration. And uh, we have, again, applied the two uh, wavelengths uh, to acquire chromarine uh, in the blue and also fluorescine in the green. Now, you can actually also combine these two images together as an overview. And again, you can see a shift here from the uh, green from the left, from the right hand side to the blue to the left hand side. Now this can be also uh, analyzed with image analysis tool. So first of all I want to show you the high um, resolution images here on the left hand side coming from the uh, stimulated uh, part. Uh, you have more blue cells uh, in comparison to the green cells. But still here with the unstimulated uh, uh, cells on the right hand side you have definitely more higher uh, concentration of only green cells. Now, if we're looking at the image analysis, so we have taken these images and we have used one of our ready-made image analysis application modules uh, in MetaExpress. So this one here is called Motivation Cell Storing. We first decide how many wavelengths you have, and here, the second wavelength we uh, uh, chosen here to be in the Darby channel, and we're looking at the intensities in the nucleus and the cytoplasm. You can give uh, cutoffs for the minimum and the maximum width of these cells, and also for the intensity. So this helps us later on to also classify these cells and put them into um, like a, a positive and negative cells. So if I then analyze these cells, you see the segmentation mark here of these uh, uh, objects, and I can click on any kind of cell and see information in the cell by cell table. And it gives me information, for example, here the uh, cell average intensity. Now, if I look at the image analysis results of the whole plate, here we also compare the intensity of the marine against the fluorescein and calculate the ratio. And uh, again, it's correspondence uh, to the uh, images. Um, here, a uh, much higher uh, ratio on the left hand side with the high uh, appearance of uh, blue cells in comparison to here, the right hand side, a very, very low um, uh, uh, ratio between uh, chromarine and fluorescein. Now, what you can also look at is just the um, average intensity of the chromarine. Uh, channel. So again, here very high on the left hand side and very low on the uh, right hand side. Now, if you actually do your uh, classification of these cells and calculate the percentage of positives, um, this uh, this effect becomes more apparent um, with like you know um, a ratio or like a um, a range here from um, two to three percent on the right hand side to almost like 50 or 60 percent on the left hand side. Now, what we can then do is to annotate this plate in our acuity express software, in our mining software. So you tell uh, in which position, in which well you have, which concentration of your uh, drugs, in this case your uh, cover code. And uh, again, your high concentration and uh, low concentration to the right hand side. Now, what we then do is to do some cross-fitting in the acute express software and also calculate the EC50. Now, the result here of the EC50 from this plate here is very comparable to the uh, one we acquired or we achieved with the 
a fake leader. Now we have also looked at um, images from a competitor plate. So here on the left hand side you see the marine and fluorescene uh, acquired on the cyclohelicine plate. Uh, this was a very thin plate, 190 micrometers thick, um, in comparison to competitor plates, which usually have a much thicker plate bottom. And you see uh, the differences here. Uh, you have a much better signal to noise and uh, on the uh, cyclohelicine uh, plate. In comparison to the right hand side here, you also see a very strong halo around these uh, objects, around these cells, uh, which can cause problems in image analysis. So this also speaks for the uh, image quality and the optical properties of these uh, screen star plates. So what we also did is we compared the two instruments, the Image Express Micro and also the Paradigm, the plate reader, and we try to figure out how much uh, we can actually see any kind of object, for example, these kind of scratches we created now in the plate, on the microscope. So here we actually stitched four images together in one of these images. Now, with the paradigm reader, we actually acquired uh, a difference from any kind of um, location. And what you can see here is you can also detect the uh, pattern of these scratches, and as we look at the uh, average intensity or the area covered, uh, this is now um, normalized against the maximum area covered. We see quite similar uh, percentages. So uh, from this, we can also say like that the uh, paradigm reader uh, can also detect um, patterns. Uh, like um, growth effects and proliferations uh, in our in our wells. So, I mean, do you want to add something to that? Okay. So, probably one one thing to add is uh, what we did here is a um, uh, fourteen by fourteen data point scan, as you can see on the right hand side. And this data was also further. Um, analyzed or different um, similar studies were actually done by our colleagues. So if you are interested in such comparison studies, please feel free to contact us and we can provide you the data. Okay, so that's my part again, Christian, and I will just give an outlook or just a, a short introduction to the last essay we, we tried. So this was this was the new outcome. And um, for the output assay, we fix the neurons with ethanol acetic acid and then stain the neural structure with a fit label beta subulin antibody. Mm -hmm. And in parallel, the nuclei of the neurons are stained with the DAPI. We tried different fixation procedures and we found out that the formalin, or we tried formalin and ethanol acetic acid fixation and found out that the latter one worked much better. After formalin fixation, the cells were washed away. After the several required washing steps of an antibody staining, so we had to repeat the assay, and in the second step we used the ethanol acetic acid method, which was much better. The fit and baby labels are only detectable in a microscope, so in microscopy for fluorescence reader, the signals are unfortunately too weak. So Christian will show you some um, results he ob obtained in the Image Express with this kind of essay. Christian? Yeah, um, so then we use the Image Express micro, uh, microscope here with a 4 objective and the screen star plate. And uh, in the upper panel here in blue, you see um, a montage of images in the plate in the uh, red channels and the blue channel. And in the lower panel, you see a montage of images uh, in the green channel uh, showing tubulin. And already you see, uh, when you look from the left hand side to the right hand side, uh, with increased concentration of sporosporine, um, that we actually have a lower number of cells. And also you can see here um, much uh, less uh, tubulin, so much less outgrowth in these cells. Now we can also um, contrast these two wavelengths together and look at the higher uh, resolution images. 
So, again, here on the left hand side, you see this image is coming from uh, a low or untreated uh, assault um, without the uh, phosphorine, where you have a noise outgrowth which can then be detected by image analysis. On the right hand side, we hardly see any outgrowth at all. We only can see the uh, um, cell outlines or the cell bodies, and also the number of cells is much decreased with this high concentration of source scoring. Now for image analysis, um, we uh, also um, use the individual wavelengths. So here, the uh, nuclear marker and the tubuline marker. And we used one of our pre-made image analysis application modules called Neurite Outgrowth. And here, you simply say in which wavelength you have your cell body and in which wavelength you have your uh, outgrowth. And in addition, you have an optional nuclear marker. And again, you enter things like uh, the minimum and ma maximum width of these objects and how bright they are about the local background. Now, when you do the image analysis, and here you see the pigmentation outline, it clearly detects the, um, the outgrowth and also the, fix, uh, the thicknesses. And if I click on an individual cell, in a cell by cell table, you have information about the uh, total uh, proce uh, processes and the mean uh, process length, you have information about how many branch points you have, and also about the uh, cell body area, as well as how straight these uh, cells are. So all these um, uh, all these measurements can be used to uh, describe your uh, your phenotype. Now, in addition to fluorescence, you can also use transmitted light, the so transmitted light option of the Image Express Micro. And uh, here you see two images on the left hand side uh, without uh, source fluorine and the right hand side with a high concentration of source fluorine where you always see these uh, cells like um, dying and um, when I now add like you know uh, transmitted light um, you can see that uh, you don't necessarily have to use the uh, fluorescence uh, to detect these structures that uh, could be also done label free uh, just with the transmitted light option here. Okay, so we come to the end of the of the webinar today, and I really go just quickly through the summary and outlook. Mm, the first point we wanted to emphasize was that um, pre-differentiated or the the high side that this is really an easy way and easy to handle system in order to generate data with based on IPS, on human IPS. Um, we tried it as well with self-differentiated IPS, and this is possible as well. However, we think it's much too time and labor, um, uh, labor, labor um, consuming and also too expensive or relatively expensive to the, due to the, to the media and consumables we need or the media mainly we need. And coating is essential for the, the cells. PLA, PLO lemonin was the best, and every test worked very, very fine in 1536-style microplate format. It was never a problem on in cell growth, cell attachment, or whatever else. Um, and due to this, we can say also 96 were created for our plates. This is not an issue. And we, we have seen also that cyclone film bottom plates really have an advantage, advantage in some kind of applications, especially when it's going via microscopy. Uh, finally, I will, would like, for my part, also to say something um, about the paradigm in the image express. Um, so the paradigm is really an easy, uh, easy and versatile tool, easy to handle tool with with, uh, with very fast data analysis options. And what I like really with the paradigm uh, with, are these kind of different options of the statistic analysis. I do not know something uh, similar from other um, fluorescent readers. So the software is very nice, and the image express is in contrast more for, of course, more for high content streaming and microscopic approach. It gives much more detailed information, but also the data analysis needs more time and it's more you know, kind of complicated. Um, however, also it's feasible, and as you, ha as you have seen, the data are quite comparable. So, Gesha, Gesha, this is the end of our webinar from today. So I hand it over to you for the question and answer section. Thank you very much, Rainer, and thank you to Kathleen and Christian for uh, presenting the data. 
and for their collaboration. Again, uh, this is a collaboration between Molecular Devices and Griner uh, by one. And so with that, we're going to um, go over to uh, questions. Again, if you have some questions, please type them in the Q&A session. We have just a couple minutes left, so I'll um, just go through a few questions. And if we run out of time, uh, we are happy to contact you afterwards and um, um, go through your questions individually. So um, for um, some of the questions that we've seen, um, one was about recording of this webinar. Uh, we will have the, um, the webinar recording posted on both molecular devices as, as well as Griner's website. And we will be sending out a link to everyone that has registered. So if you uh, missed something or you want to review um, the um, whatever points are covered, you're welcome to, to um, look over it again. Um, let me see some other questions that we might have here. Um, we have one. Um, do you think that the IPS approach will replace completely cell-based assays based on genetically modified cells, such as, for instance, a beta-lactamate or protogene assay? Um, Reiner, would you like to um, answer that one? Um, sorry, Keisha, can you repeat the question, please? I did not get, to get it completely. Um, sure. The yes. question was, uh, do you think that the, the IPS approach um, will replace the completely the cell-based assays based on genetically modified cells. Yeah, okay, okay. Okay, I got it. Oh, good. That's, that's a good question. And I think, no, it's not the case. So so these kind of standard um, assays, high throughput screening assays, they're really very fast, versatile. There is a large option available. And the IPS approach is a, it's a very interesting approach. Um, however, it's more more expensive. I think it's a more expensive assay, and it's also more time. So it's not as fast as the standard high throughput screening approach. And the life is just an example. It's a very simple approach. However, the the data and the results you get from the the IPS is much more yeah, detailed, much more going in in in, in further details and more 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 in, a kind of more interesting. So maybe it's a kind of second screening. Let's say, um, but completely replacement, I would not say. It's still the, the classic high throughput screening that has its place for trust discovery, in trust discovery. Okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. So, um, next question here that um, um, I got uh, was uh, for Kathleen about the paradigm system. When you're reading on the fly, uh, will you touch the walls, the walls of the well, and uh, and is there a possibility of getting a false signal? So, um, what you actually do is only moving uh, the plate uh, or reading when it's in the center of the plate. So you will definitely omit the cell walls and everything which is near the cell walls so you don't get any false uh, signals. So we ensured that this will not have any effect. Okay, great. And uh, one last question we'll squeeze in is a uh, question for you. Um, how long did it take to acquire that plate data? So uh, the acquisition is actually uh, a little bit dependent on like the number of wavelengths and also like how many images you take per wall. Um, so that section that we have shown there to acquire on the uh, to say that plate uh, took uh, only several minutes. Um, so in comparison to the uh, paradigm to the plate reader, of course that is uh, takes a little bit longer. Um, However, um, here you get, of course, much detailed information about the cells. So uh, with these four 
positions and two weight lengths uh, over these uh, routes. It just only took a couple of minutes. Okay, great. Uh, so I think with that, we will end our uh, webinar. Thank you all for attending. Thank you again to our presenters. If you have additional questions, uh, you have our contact information, feel free to, to send us an email um, later. Uh, thank you, everybody, and goodbye.